just going to give it a minute for people to click in. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm the director of Boston University's Global Development Policy Center. Our mission is to advance policy oriented research on financial stability, human well being, and environmental sustainability across the world. And welcome to our event today uh, Building Back a Better International Monetary Fund and Global Financial Safety Net. We have uh, four incredible guests uh, with us that are part of a larger group that released a, a report today. Uh, under under the same title. The year 2021 is year two in the most important decade of the century, where drastic reductions in carbon dioxide emissions and inequalities in a manner that raises standards of living is paramount to the survival of the world's people and planet Earth itself. Yet, 2020 saw the biggest economic downturn since the Great Depression and pushed upwards of 124 million people into extreme poverty. 2020 was also the hottest year on record triggering forest fires, hurricanes, droughts, and other extreme weather events that accentuated the economic shock of the COVID-19 pandemic brought to the world economy. In this context, many emerging market and developing countries started the decade desperate for liquidity and in fear of default. Even more will face a debt overhang that could take more than a decade to come out from under. This is to be the decade where the world realizes the sustainable development goals and raises the ambitions of the Paris Climate Agreement not one that is characterized by human suffering and economic instability. The COVID-19 pandemic and associated economic crisis put great stress on the so-called global financial safety net or GFSN as you'll hear our speakers discuss. The GFSN is comprised of central bank swap lines from key currency issuing nations. The International Monetary Fund is at its center. The regional financial arrangements, along with other central bank bilateral swap lines and individual countries' foreign reserve holdings and capital flow management measures, and a loose ad hoc system for sovereign debt restructuring. Resulting from a number of formal and informal workshops conducted throughout 2020 and 2021, today we release a new report uh, called Building Back a Better Global Financial Safety Net, which spells out a number of proposals that should be high on the agenda of the International Monetary Fund, the G20, regional financial arrangements, and in national capitals as the world community works to combat COVID-19, protect the vulnerable, and mount a green and inclusive recovery. We're going to hear from four of the authors of today's report, uh, but let me just give you a quick overview of some of the major recommendations that come from other authors. I should say that the workshop was co-sponsored with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences Institute for World Economics and Politics, and Hai Hong Gao, uh, one of the deputy directors there, is the co-editor with myself of the report. Uh, collectively, our set of recommendations are basically to scale the uh, level of the global financial safety net and align it better with our development uh, and growth goals over time. Some of the specific things that come out of the report are issuing more special drawing rights and expanding the use of them through the International Monetary Fund. Something we'll hear about from Edward Truman uh, today is to establish a multilateral swap facility at the International Monetary Fund to increase quota-based resources at the IMF with associated governance reforms, uh, to uh, reform the emergency financing that the fund is engaged with so that they're counter-cyclical uh, and don't have uh, austerity-led measures inside of them, to really focus on coordinating and focusing on capital flow volatility and the appropriate management measures, to mainstream climate change throughout the processes of the global financial safety net and recognize that climate change is increasingly a macro-critical issue and to initiate debt restructuring and relief in initiatives that work toward a broader sovereign debt restructuring regime. Again, there's a number of authors in the report that uh, collectively lay out those arguments and the technical reasons for why they're uh, important in today's time. Can't have all of them with us today because of uh, uh, time zone issues, et cetera. But I just wanna mention Li Ching Zhang, Wen Qi, uh, Matthew Cummings, Aizong Zhang, Meng Wei Yu, Xiao Fan Tan, 
and others that were part of the report that couldn't be with us today. Today, we do have the, uh, uh, the pleasure and the privilege of having four distinguished guests. Uh, each will give a short five minute presentation about the key aspects of their proposal in the, in the report. And then we should have plenty of time for questions and answers with all of you. Uh, we will start with uh, Edwin Truman, uh, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Masavar Ramini Center for Business and Government at Harvard University. He's a former senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and of course, a renowned treasury official and expert on these issues in the United States and globally for some time. Uh, he'll be followed by Isabel Ortiz. She is the director of the Global Social Justice Program at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia University. And she was the former director of the International Labor Organization and UNICEF. Uh, uh, following her, we will hear from Rakesh Mohan. He's the president and distinguished fellow of the Center for Social and Economic Progress, formerly Brookings Inst India. Uh, he was a former deputy governor of the Reserve Bank of India and former executive director at the International Monetary Fund representing Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Sri Lanka. Uh, and then we'll be uh, uh, the, closed by Ulrich Wolf, who's a reader in economics at SOAS University of London, where he's the founding director of the SOAS Center for Sustainable Finance. He's also a senior research fellow at the German Development Institute and an honorary professor of economics at the University of Leipzig. So without further ado, please let me uh, pass it over to Edwin Truman. Uh, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner of your Zoom here, you'll see a Q&A button. So please, uh, first and foremost, introduce yourself, tell us who you are, and then add a little question there. And after our presenters make their arguments from the report, I will field clusters of questions for the different speakers so we can have a global conversation about these important issues. Let me pass it over to Edwin Truman. Thanks so much for, for coming, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Let me share my screen here. Let me take a minute. Oops, that's here. I hope I got to get this one here right. I think it's here. I hope this does it. Does it good? Uh, okay. Uh, am I on? Does yes, anybody hear me? Away, Edwin. Okay, Ted. Ted Truman. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for your introduction. It's a pleasure to participate in this webinar uh, and present my thoughts on one component of the of the report dealing with how the major central bank can contribute. Uh, to a to the global financial safety net to a greater extent uh, than they do today. Uh, that safety net, as you know, consists of many components, some of which are more developed than others. Uh, and a major missing element is a systemic liquidity component. Not that there are some not some isolated facilities, but they're not in, uh, organized in a consistent manner. So my contribution in this volume is to sketch out how such a co component could be developed <clears throat> and integrated into the global financial safety nets. So I have five key points here. Uh, first, it would be quite simple to establish a mechanism to, through which the central banks could augment IMF lending and a, and a safety net. Uh, the most promising would be to build on uh, existing central bank, <coughs> excuse me, swap facilities. In today's global financial system, uh, there are 11 swap networks or the equivalent covering more than half of the members of the International Monetary Fund and accounting for almost 90% of world GDP. Uh, these swap facilities, however, are not linked generally and generally are not on the scale necessarily deal with the uh, crises. And this is true in particular of the short-term liquidity uh, line that was set up by the IMF. It just doesn't it will provide liquidity, but only in very small thimbles full. Um, existing swap network could be scaled up and coordinated to support the IMF, uh, which is of course the central inter 
institution, at least as far as I'm concerned, in the global financial safety net. And uh, uh, this proposed new component last would help to stabilize the financial system and the global economy in a crisis, and would also augment uh, temporarily the IMF's limited resources. So I sketch out in the uh, my contribution three types of structures, of which there are many others, uh, but three could be considered. The first would be just uh, loose ad hoc links to the IMF. Actually, some swap arrangements can be and often have been explicitly linked to IMF uh, lending. Uh, and almost all are implicitly linked uh, in the sense that this IMF is always there uh, for these countries. But those linkages could be tightened uh, and coordinated. Second, uh, you could have some second short-term central bank loans to the fund. A group of central bank to commit to provide unlimited financial resources to the fund in fixed proportions, <coughs> excuse me, agreed in advance. The process and, and condition for triggering the funds access to the network would also need to be agreed in advance. And the drawing countries would need to face a common short-term liquidity problem, be judged to be able to repay within a year, which is characteristic of swap networks, and commit to longer-term adjustment programs with the fund if they cannot do so. And the third structure that one can think about would have a, what I call a three-key approach. In the first key, the fund would declare a need for a global liquidity addition. The second key, the central banks that had previously established a global swap network agree or not with that uh, judgment. Uh, and the third key, each central bank would decide for itself whether to respond and individual central banks would remain, remain free to extend bilateral swap credits. This is a somewhat more complicated structure, which I spell out a little more detail. Uh, and I actually favor this one. So let me look at three comments on this. The first is that this facility would stretch uh, the IMS financial resources because many drawings on an IMS-based swap facility would be repaid within a year. And only a few countries would need to draw on the fund to repay their, their drawings. And this, in that sense, the swap facility would stretch the IMS's resources, which are limited <laughs> on a temporary basis. Second, central bank participation would be voluntary. That is consistent with the variety of um, mandates of central banks uh, in the world, but the objective should be to maximize participation. And third, uh, in my view, if transparency about uh, would be important, Many central bank swap arrangements operations, the transparency of them are, is quite poor at this point. Federal Reserve is an exception, uh, but I think transparency should be a central feature of this proposed structure, as well as many other features in <coughs> international financial system. So my conclusion is that it would be relatively easy to design uh, 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 such an augmentation to the global financial safety, safety net. The hurdles we face are, uh, are a lack of consensus and interest and political support. It's also true that some central banks are seized on operations as providing international roles for the currency, which is a somewhat different motivation than just the safety net. Uh, for the Federal Reserve, the cause, causality is reversed, in my view. Because the dollar, because the dollar is the premier international currency, the Fed has the need and responsibility to meet the global demand for liquidity, as it did in the global financial crisis and the and this ongoing pandemic. Of course, some in the United States criticize the Fed swap operations, and many are also likely to oppose strengthening the IMF in this manner. However, such a swap facility would add an important component to the global financial safety net and stabilize, help to stabilize the international financial system in a crisis. Thank you very much. Thanks I will so much. stop share. Thanks so much, Ted. And now we'll move on to Dr. Isabel Ortiz. Thank you very much, Kevin, for the opportunity to present today. And um, we have only five minutes. So I thought, let me, 
So this slide um, could summarize um, IMF fiscal policy over the recent years. And what we have here is the number of countries contracting public expenditure uh, from 2008, the first years, and 2009, and until 2020, uh, 25, when, when the IMF uh, fiscal projections contained in the World Economic Outlook finish. Um, so you see the number of countries contracting. What this graph is telling us is that in 2008, 2009, and 2020, uh, because of the global financial crisis and because of the pandemic, actually very few countries were contracting. However, the, after these very short periods in which actually IMF advised to, you know, to expand public spending, what we have is an increasing number of countries contracting. Um, we had a decade of adjustment really, which it was from 2010 to 2019. And here the different colors mean uh, the light blue means uh, high income countries and the darker blue developing countries. And why we are uh, pointing this is because many people thought that austerity was a European problem. This is not correct. Actually, um, austerity or fiscal contraction was much harder, uh, much more prevalent in developing countries. Um, in, from 2010, from 2019. But what is happening is that this year, as we're speaking, countries are starting to contract public expenditures too, because of fiscal deficits and debt, growing debt. Um, so uh, the IMF fiscal projections predict uh, that this will be the fiscal behavior of governments uh, since 2021 to, to 2025. And um, this is very worrisome, given that, as we are all um, here concerned, development needs are large in, in developing countries, but as well as the recovery needs of, of any high income economy. So it, the, you know, to only have one year of, of fiscal expansion followed by, by a hard uh, year of, of contraction, uh, this appears extremely premature. It was premature during the financial crisis and it's premature today. Um, and um, the, the adjustment this year is estimated at uh, minus 3.3% of GDP as an average per country, but that it can be very large. You know? And this is a map simply to, to illustrate what we are talking. Uh, in color, what you have is the countries that will be contracting public expenditure this year or next year. And as you can see, uh, well, it's virtually the whole world. This year, 154 countries, and next year, 159. There are 192 in the whole world. Um, so in terms of population, it means that more than 6 billion people or 85% of the world population will be living under austerity by next year, which is a large amount. This will be an, an experience uh, that everybody will have to suffer. In terms of the levels, uh, what we find is that um, there's high levels of expenditure contraction, particularly in 42 countries, and this is a quarter of the world. And what we have here, uh, it is countries that will be cutting over and spending in real value um, this year, next year, compared to 2018-19. And I mean, 2018-19, as we saw, there were already expenditures were very, very low because it was after a decade of adjustment. Okay, so there's an, uh, about 42 that they are really contracting uh, a lot. And a number of countries are contracting more than 20% of the budget. And you're talking of very poor countries like Libya, uh, um, Liberia, South Sudan, uh, Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Zambia, which are in dire need of development funds. And how are going, governments going to cut? Um, well, the fiscal the, the fiscal cuts that uh, that occurred during the adjustment decade from 2010 to 19 were focused on on mostly seven uh, policies. Well, actually five and two revenue raising, and this has been this was the standard austerity formula advised by IMF officials um, everywhere, and um, with variations on countries, uh, but that is kind of the the, the standard. And very interestingly, um, all of these measures have negative social impacts. So they are to be avoided. I mean, if cuts are to be done, they can be done from other areas, not these ones. So most common one was eliminating subsidies like food, agriculture, and fuel. Uh, this happened in 132 countries, which will cut caps. Uh, that means reducing or freezing the salaries and the number of 
public sector workers that provide essential services to the population, like education, health, social workers, teachers. Teachers tend to be the larger amount of, of, uh, of you know, in the budget. Um, then, interestingly, a very common measure that confused many people was rationalizing a narrow tar tar targeting welfare or safety nets. And they here, the term used by IMF was to strengthening safety net, and that confused everybody. Reality was that if the social uh, assistance system was like that, they were actually narrow, benefits were narrow targeted to the very, very poor, and benefits were actually low, so for cost savings. And that was done at a time where actually the, the need was to expand social protection, not to, to, not to contract it. So, so uh, it, it did leave a tradition of, of targeting, which is, uh, you know, with negative social impacts, leaving vulnerable a large amount of the population, and particularly the middle classes, that in most developing countries, middle class are kind of very low income and need support. Then there were a number of pension and social security reforms, adjusting benefits and entitlements. And um, that's important to, to say because when I was in, in ILO, a director in ILO, we actually estimated that pensioners are going to receive much lower pensions in the majority of countries because of this type of adjustments. They were reforms not adequately done. Um, then there were labor reflexibilization reforms in 89 countries, uh, reducing employment protection for workers and health reforms in about 56 countries, which actually uh, reducing the capacity of governments to respond to COVID-19. On the revenue side, they were creating on consumption taxes increases. Um, uh, in a majority of countries, and this is a regressive type of tax, and one should try to avoid it and actually try to look for progressive taxation sources. And then privatizations in 60 countries, and actually, um, you know, strengthening of PPPs in another 60 countries. So that is the typical formula that we might expect uh, that we saw in the last uh, decade, and we might see happening again in the following decade. And the most important lesson here, and I'm going to finish with the next slide, is that actually all this is not needed. Uh, there are alternatives to austerity and there are different fiscal policies that can be done. Um, there are at least uh, eight options. Uh, they're fully supported by policy statements of the, not only of the United Nations, but also of the international financial institutions and governments have been applying them for decades. That means that governments don't have to run with a very small budget, but actually expand the budget to, to, you know, to be able to invest adequately in socioeconomic recovery as we need at the moment, even in the poorest countries. And we don't have time to explain here, but I'm just going to name these options. Uh, the first one and most obvious is to increase tax revenues through progressive sources. So that means that you will not uh, go for VAT or consumption taxes, you will go for income or wealth taxations and corporate taxes, including to the financial sector that, tend, that tends to be under tax in the majority of countries. Um, for in, and we have great examples from developing countries. For instance, Brazil during 15 years actually had a financial transaction tax that, that was successful, um, but it was removed by a, a later government. Um, second option is to increase social security coverage, formalizing workers in the informal economy with good contracts. And we have very good examples of how that ex expanded social protection in Argentina, Brazil, Tunisia, Uruguay, and other countries. Third will be to fight illicit financial flows that are illegal, like money laundering or tax evasion. Fourth, restructuring or reducing debt. And we have good experiences for more than, from more than 60 countries in recent years. Fifth will be to have more aid and transfers. This is obvious only for, for low-income countries. Uh, but they're interesting global proposals like a global social protection fund. Six, a tap into fiscal and foreign exchange reserves like Chile or Norway have done. Uh, seventh, adopting a more accommodative macroeconomic framework. That means some tolerance to inflation and fiscal deficit like virtually all countries have done. And eight, reallocating public expenditures, focusing on replacing those with high cost and low social impact um, for investments that have 
significant impact on socioeconomic recovery. And for instance, Costa Rica and Thailand move uh, funds from uh, defense and military and move them towards health, which was a good example to follow. Now, what is very important is that all these different alternatives must be discussed openly in national dialogue. Uh, these decisions affect the lives of millions of people, of the whole population, and cannot just be taken behind closed doors. It is very important that these measures and these options are discussed openly in national dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ortiz. And now we'll move to Rakesh Mohan uh, from the uh, end from India. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, for including me in this webinar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be a part of this. Um, let me now try and share the screen. Thank you. So um, I'm talking on a what might perhaps be seen as a relatively narrow topic, though I think it does have a wider significance. That is uh, what we need to do on IMF uh, quota reforms and governance um, in the light of uh, what is the, the huge changes uh, taking place in the global economy, uh, particularly over the last 20 years and uh, which are going to intensify further in the next uh, 20 years. So what are the key issues? First, that uh, the existing IMF quota shares and therefore the governance of the International Monetary Fund and, other, and by the way, World Bank and others is really very significantly out of alignment with the changing global economic structure. Um, to say it in a very broad fashion, the center of gravity of the global economy is shifting back towards the Indian Ocean from the North Atlantic after perhaps 200, 250 years. So this is really an epochal event, which one doesn't expect to see in a few generations. So we are now going through a huge global shift in the economic structure, which has not been seen for something like 200, 250 years. Um, with the uh, increasing weight of uh, Asian economies in the global economy, and which will get further intensified over the next 20 years or so and, 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 and beyond. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, this is not being reflected in the framework of global economic governance, where uh, the G7 nations essentially, and the sort of post Second World War economic and political power structure uh, is still dominating. Uh, the consequence of this is that emerging and developing economies are heavily underrepresented uh, in these bodies. And as it happens, so is the US, which may come as a surprise to many. Uh, what is overrepresented now is the European Union. To uh, just uh, illustrate this from, from, from the data, that if you see uh, the top left-hand corner in these graphs, these charts, the share of the emerging and developing economy, this is on a PPP basis, a share in global GDP, uh, has been growing very fast since the turn of the century or turn of the millennium. Uh, that is the blue dotted, uh, blue, blue dashed uh, line. And whereas the share of um, um, the, 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 the share of the IMF quota has remained broadly constant over this period. And as you can see, the huge change has really come in the last 20 years. And that's a very fast period in terms of, uh, in, in terms of time elapsed. Um, second, you can see uh, in the, the Europe, European Union share uh, in, in GDP, in the market exchange rates is the, is the gray dashed line. The red dotted line is in, the, in PPT, PPP terms, whereas the quota has remained high and unchanging all through. Um, in a different um, uh, groups, you look at advanced economy changes going on since 1980, that is the blue bars and the orange bars are the emerging and developing economies. And in some sense, the position is almost reversed relative to uh, 40 years ago. Um, and then you look at the European Union and the major advanced economies, G7 and uh, the BRICS, 
And so once again, you can see how the BRICS are now going to be dominating in the coming years. So um, the other thing that has happened is that it is very interesting that by the Articles Association of the IMF, there ought to be a quarter review every five years. In fact, there have been delays uh, on a constant, consistent basis, particularly in the last 20 years, just when emerging and developing economies shares are going up in terms of global GDP. So uh, sometimes there have been no quota increases. Uh, the 15th review is completely had no quota increase. Uh, sometimes there's been a long delay that something that was agreed in 2010 was finally implemented in 2016. And now uh, in the current situation, um, so, so, so the existing quota shares are based on economic data from around 2008. The earliest now that they will be changed will be something like 2024. So it will be already 15 to 16 years out of date in terms of uh, the global economy. Um, and of course, uh, there's been uh, dissatisfaction with the current uh, governance arrangements, which has, which has led to a good deal of fragmentation in the global financial safety net. So you have uh, a burgeoning number of regional financial arrangements, new regional institutions, uh, and so on. Um, now, with post-COVID, we can expect uh, th that because of the huge uh, QE that is going on by central banks um, and the, uh, the, the, the unconventional monetary policies uh, with very low interest rates, uh, and of course, the fiscal problems that are also uh, arising, there's a potential ballooning of debt and liabilities arising from ultra cheap money. And therefore, there's an increasing probability of crises, financial crises going forward. We haven't yet come to it, but they will come in the next few years. Thus, therefore, there's really an urgent and strong need for a well-funded IMF with equitable governance and perhaps supplemented by the kind of measures that Ted Truman just, uh, just gave us. Uh, if we don't do all these things, we could see serious risk to global financial st stability in the coming years. So what is the way forward? Uh, clearly, for its credibility and effectiveness, the governance structure has to become much more equitable. Um, at the same time, I would say that, uh, that, that there is need, uh, in my view, for the US to retain its leadership role because it does provide a certain stability to the global system and will continue to do so in the coming years. And its quota share therefore actually needs to be increased as it is underrepresented if you go by its GDP share in the world. Um, and in terms of, I suppose, the domestic political uh, establishment in the United States, that would also help in preserving this veto stroke leadership role in the IMF and the international monetary system. Uh, at the same time, of course, as China approaches and then surpasses the US uh, its share of global GDP at market exchange rates, its quota share would have to be back to similar to the United States as we go along. Uh, similarly, role of the other emerging and developing economies, including that of India, would also need to increase uh, in governance, uh, but also the, the, the role have to be enhanced. And that would, what that means in the formula uh, for the for, for, for quotas of the IMF, the weight of GDP would have to be uh, reduced, it have to be increased, and that of openness uh, would need to be reduced. Um, and here, there's a real problem now that in some sense, five years ago, one could have said US and China could should cooperate to undertake leadership of the reform, given the problems now taking place between the US, United States and China, this of course has become more difficult but nonetheless, it does seem to me that, uh, that, that you need uh, enlightenment, statesmanship, and wise diplomacy to accomplish this, given the current sort of geostrategic atmosphere in the world uh, with, with the emergence, with, with the rapid emergence of China, both as an economic power, as well as a political power and increasingly a technological power. Um, in the leadership of the Bretton Woods institutions, of course, it's IMF and US nationals who have led, I'm sorry, that it is European and US nationals who have led um, the IMF and the World Bank uh, respectively. And this does uh, need, need, need to be corrected. But we can have no illusion, there are new emerging challenges. As I just mentioned, the US-China trade war and race for supremacy, but also increasing intra -e emerging market issues. Um, First of all, there's a slowing, broad slowing of uh, growth in emerging markets. 
Second, uh, the BRICS uh, grouping, which was working pretty much together for a significant period of time until about four, three, four years ago, is now becoming even more difficult as the largest components of BRICS, that is India and China now are at loggerheads because of the border conflict. So uh, looking for uh, cooperation among ourselves also become much more troublesome and much more difficult. However, however, having said all that, absence of progress would mean the withering of the IMF as a key institution responsible for the international monetary system, um, leading to fragment international monetary system with increasing risks to global financial stability and global well-being. And the point here is that, that given how interconnected the global economy is, particularly the global financial economy, that increasing uh, risks in different parts of the world then become global risks, and hence the urgency for reform of the kind that I've suggested. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kevin, for including me in this, and I look forward to the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Uh, before our question and answer session, we'll uh, go to Ulrich Vols. And for those of you in the audience, uh, please uh, enter your questions and introduce yourselves in the little Q&A box at the bottom right hand corner of the Zoom. Ulrich. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, thanks a lot for, for having me today and in indeed uh, inviting me to contri uh, contribute to the um, report. And uh, it's really unfortunate that, that Hai Hong cannot be with us today and so I've, I've jumped in in the very last minute uh, and hope I can, can make some valuable additions. So um, I, I'll briefly touch on, two, on the two chapters that I've contributed to this report. And the first one is on the IMF and the macro criticality of climate change. Um, so recently, you, you hear actually a lot coming from the IMF on, on, on uh, climate change, but that um, is actually only relatively recent. Um, in in 2017-18, I was involved um, in research commissioned by the UN, where we were able to show for the first time that climate vulnerable countries have to pay a risk premium uh, on their sovereign debt because of their climate vulnerability. And we've... Um, uh, been able to show in some follow-up research, um, have a deeper look at this nexus between um, climate change, um, uh, macroeconomic impacts, uh, uh, and also uh, public finances, and uh, how uh, through different transmission channels climate change can have an impact um, on public finances, uh, debt sustainability, and sovereign risk. And uh, this is really the, the backdrop um, of, of, of this chapter that I've contributed um, and uh, where uh, I'm arguing that um, we need the IMF and indeed also regional financing arrang arrangements to pay much more close attention to the impacts of climate change on the macro uh, financial system. And um, we basically need uh, the IMF and also RFAs to mainstream climate issues across the operations because uh, all the things that the IMF and, and the other uh, uh, bodies that govern the global financial safety net um, uh, should care about are in one way or another affected by climate change. And um, so we have seen um, uh, very positive developments more recently at the IMF, where Kristalina Georgieva, the managing director, uh, has been very vocal um, on the need to, to um, uh, pay more attention to climate change. But at the op operational level, things have been moving uh, very slowly. I think we are now moving towards a situation where uh, the importance of the topic is being appreciated. Um, but uh, now there is a big challenge of really integrating uh, climate um, considerations into all these different uh, responsibilities that the IMF has. Um, so into uh, surveillance and monitoring, um, uh, also in capacity building where the IMF can arguably uh, play a very important role. Um, and also um, the IMF needs to update its lending uh, toolkit to better, uh, uh, to be better prepared to, to serve uh, countries that face exogenous shocks through climate change and as in particular uh, a large number of um, highly climate vulnerable countries uh, that are not really um, having access right now to, to, to facilities uh, that would cater their situation. 
Uh, so these are the kind of things that I'm discussing in, in, in this chapter. Um, and uh, the second chapter that I contributed uh, is on uh, debt relief for green and inclusive recovery uh, with a nice title, Avoiding Too Little Too Late. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Kevin Gallagher and other colleagues, including Shamshad Akhtar, the former finance minister and central bank governor of Pakistan. Um, and we've been uh, arguing uh, since last summer that we have a massive debt crisis looming in the global south. So this needs to be addressed, of course. Um, but it's important that we bring that into uh, connection with the other crisis we are facing. So the uh, climate and, and uh, ecological crisis. And um, indeed, as I just argued before, um, the, the climate uh, crisis is also undermining uh, uh, public finances, imposing huge macro financial risks to economies. And so it is important uh, that countries uh, address these macro financial risks and, and uh, build resilience. And um, so uh, we won't have, uh, or we won't be able to solve problems of debt sustainability uh, if these macro financial uh, vulnerabilities are not being addressed. So we do need uh, to provide room for these countries to invest in uh, resilience. Uh, and these are uh, really crucial investments for many of these countries. And of course, uh, we are now also in a huge humanitarian crisis, a huge social crisis, um, with COVID having, having thrown back um, uh, uh, huge numbers of people back into poverty um, and um, uh, so we need uh, to have uh, governments in a position where they have enough fiscal space to also invest in um, uh, uh, health systems, in, in social uh, safety nets and all that. Um, and so we are basically calling for um, a comprehensive approach um, where um, debt relief uh, is designed in a way that it can provide room for countries that need it. Um, to um, uh, enable a green and inclusive recovery. And it cannot be only green, um, it has to be inclusive. Um, um, so the social dimension is really important. And we're putting uh, forward uh, some ideas on how this could be done. I won't have time now to, to really deep uh, go deep into that, but uh, the starting point has to be that we need a comprehensive analysis of debt sustainability that uh, does pay attention uh, to climate risks um, that does take into account the enormous investment needs in resilience, in sustainable development. Um, and uh, so it's not the kind of standard uh, uh, debt sustainability analysis that the IMF uh, would have conducted in the past. We need a much more comprehensive assessment. Um, and based on that analysis, we then need to see which countries need debt relief. And then, um, and I fear I won't have time to, to, to explain that in greater detail, but uh, these countries then uh, should be um, uh, uh, given real debt relief, of course, including the private sector, um, uh, 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 private uh, creditors, um, uh, but at the same time then also um, have this tied uh, to um, uh, commitments that will um, facilitate um, kind of these green inclusive recoveries um, so it's not your kind of standard uh, IMF program. Um, uh, and importantly, um, this is really uh, to address the vulnerabilities facing these countries and really putting them, enabling, uh, empowering them uh, to, to really invest in uh, sustainable development. Because time is very short, not only on this panel, and I'll, I'll be over, uh, done, done in, a, in a minute, um, but we have uh, less than a decade to really uh, address the huge climate crisis, which is affecting uh, the global south the worst. We need to put these countries in a position to really uh, build resilience, uh, but also to get out of this crisis um, and invest in development, uh, because we also have a 2030 agenda. Uh, and there we also have less than a decade now uh, to really make progress and indeed uh, undo uh, the, the great harm uh, to development uh, that has resulted from the COVID pandemic. Uh, I'll leave it at that um, and look forward to the panel discussion.
Thank you very much, Uli, and, and all of you. Uh, we have a number of questions already in the Q&A. I should say that the report, as I noted in the beginning, also deals with issues of special drawing rights and capital flow volatility. Feel free to ask questions about those. Ted Truman has been writing about SDRs for quite a long time, and Rakesh Mohan uh, has been a chair at the BIS on many issues related to capital flow volatility. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, the first cluster of them, and maybe we can quickly have each one of you uh, answer whichever you think is the most appropriate for you uh, in the order that we went in. We have one from William Janis from Fordham Law School uh, who says, given these trends, but with the dollar still the reserve currency of the world, how far and practical can all of these changes occur? We have another question from a Boston University alum, Zenia Rosinski from New York City. Um, Ask what, what role should private investment play in facilitating emerging markets and the IMF's role in those markets? And specifically, uh, what should, if, if anything, the IMF's role be in rolling out ESG, Environment and Social Governance Guidelines in emerging markets? Uh, we have a question from Alberto Isgut from UNSCAF. It says, what about the macro criticality of the SDGs? Can't other issues such as poverty, inequality, the lack of proper health policies, also have macroeconomic implications uh, that the IMF should be focusing on, uh, including, of course, pandemics, which is a similar question that we get from Olga Jonas, who's a senior fellow at Harvard's uh, Global Health Institute and a former economic advisor at the World Bank. Uh, I'll put one more, one more there. Uh, we have Wei Liang from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies uh, and says, uh, part of the debt question is overborrowing of low-income countries what can be done more by the IMF to better monitor those, quote, irresponsible or, quote, unsustainable borrowing, especially from private or regional financial institutions? Well, there's a good cluster of questions there. Uh, why don't we start with Ted Truman? We'll go around uh, with short answers in the, uh, in the order that folks presented. We'll see if there's time to do another round before 1030. Oh, I, I will just deal with the first question. I don't think the international role of the dollar really cuts you one way or the other on any of these questions. Uh, uh, certainly as far as the swap network is concerned, a lot of the demand for liquidity is in dollars. But that, uh, I outlined in my paper a way in which that you could have a collective action uh, on the swap facility uh, and still uh, be able to uh, backstop by for those countries that needed dollar liquidity. Uh, and uh, I don't think we need to, let's put it this way, if we take on trying to change the role of the international role of the dollar, whatever you think about that, uh, 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 that that will that will take all our time. We won't be able to address some of these more important issues. Thanks, Ted. Isabel. Thank you. They are very interesting questions, but I'm going to focus on the one of the SDGs and health because it's closer to 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 a work. Um, indeed, uh, you know, poverty, inequality, and uh, you know, health, education, you name it. All the SDGs uh, should be part of macro um, um, criticality. And actually, the IMF has acknowledged that progressively. Uh, we do see a change in re recent years, and. Um, um, for the better, but it's still too slow. Now, what happened in the these different responses from the from the 2008 crisis, financial crisis, and the pandemic crisis? We see a much more stronger emphasis on investment on human development uh, during the the. The, the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. But the problem is that it is too short-lived. Uh, so in 2020, yes, they have, uh, the IMF um, economists have been supporting um, health, uh, emerg particularly emergency health spending, um, social protection to cover the most vulnerable, and of course, investments um, for socioeconomic recovery to support enterprises, corporations, et cetera. But this, it is unfortunately too premature to cut them in this year which is what we saw in the presentation. So, so that needs to be re-emphasized. It is too early to, to cut that, uh, to cut these type of expenditures at the moment and remind them that actually it was the earlier reforms to health sector uh, that left the health sector understaffed and overburdened. Uh, and actually it was that led to the, the low response uh, that it could be 
that happened to the pandemic. So it is very important to keep investing in human development and the SDGs as agreed by all governments. Um, and that must be part of the macro, uh, macro criticality. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Yeah, um, I just want to make a comment on the first question on the reserve currency. First of all, I agree with Ted that it doesn't have that much relevance to the various things that we have suggested, but certainly not to the issues that I was talking about. Having said that, um, two points. One, that uh, the dominance of the US dollar, the reserve currency, is going to continue for quite some time to come. Uh, we might recall that in the mid-2000s, uh, we were beginning to think that the euro might become a parallel reserve currency. Now, very clearly, that has not happened. The question now is that um, the, uh, the uh, role of China in global trade is much higher than the role of China in global financial markets. And that's not going to change in a hurry, as I said. But I think that we need to start thinking of what will happen uh, if uh, certain changes do take place in Chinese financial markets, capital markets, openness, et cetera, that uh, the renminbi starts becoming more of a reserve currency. It may happen in 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, who knows? But I think that it is a subject that is worth thinking about and, uh, and working on to see how one can then have arrangements in the world that have, say, two reserve currencies. Thank you. Yeah, a uh, lot of good questions. Um, so, Maybe I'll go in order. So first, um, uh, Xenia, um, your question on uh, what role should private investment play in facilitating emerging markets and my role in, in that? Well, um, you know, international capital flows, uh, including private capital, can play an important role in economic development and so on. But I think it's important to, to realize that um, uh, they cannot substitute for domestic resource mobilization. And, and um, so this narrative that we need to mobilize, uh, you know, billions of trillion, uh, billions to trillions of private capital in in advanced countries and channel these into developing emerging countries, uh, I don't think that that has been a very helpful uh, story. First of all, um, it's been more like billions to billions, so the the, the money hasn't really flown. Uh, and secondly, um, you know, we have a long history of international, uh, very volatile international capital flows and. Um, uh, so private international capital, I would say, is not the solution to, to providing long-term financing uh, for development in, in uh, developing countries by and large. So this is not to say that there is no role of private international capital, but we really should be having more discussions about domestic resource mobilization. And here I think there's also a lot of interesting developments, you know, using uh, fintech solutions and so on. Um, and uh, the IMF and also the MDBs in particular uh, can play an important role in, in, in helping uh, this domestic resource mobilization. Um, the IMF's role in, in rolling out ESG guidelines, well, uh, I mean, I would very strongly maintain that we need a, a mainstreaming of um, climate, environmental sustainability risks across financial markets in advanced and in developing emerging economies. Um, so, uh, if you want to call it ESG guidelines, and uh, fine. I mean, with ESG, you also have a lot of kind of greenwashing, you know, kind of everything is ESG nowadays. I mean, what matters at the end of the day is that environmental social risks are really being uh, taken into consideration all financing investment uh, decisions. And we certainly do need uh, central banks, supervisors, uh, those who govern finance. And that also that includes international organizations, uh, the IMF, the MDBs, uh, BIS, International Standard Setting Fora and all that, to, to really uh, take that into consideration. So, so the IMF has to play an important role, but it's not just kind of ESG uh, as such. Um, uh, Wei Liang, you mentioned, uh, quest, asked about overboring. Uh, I mean, that certainly is a risk. Uh, and, and that is related to, to, to my answer to the first question on private investment. Um, you know, pri international capital markets are very happy to provide a lot of capital when times are good, 
uh, less so when times are not that good. So uh, finance tends to be very pro-cyclical. Uh, and that's why we have to be very careful. And, and um, uh, we can certainly see uh, that in, in, in the years before the COVID crisis, we've seen a big surge of lending into emerging economies and also so-called frontier markets, which uh, previously were excluded from the international financial markets. And, and that's not surprising because interest rates were uh, zero or negative in the major advanced economies. So there was this, this big flow of capital into these countries and there has been a lot of overborrowing. And, and so we need to, to, and the IMF needs to look at this uh, uh, in, in this monitoring role. Um, and as I said, the IMF also needs to, to support countries in mobilizing domestic resources and, and uh, we certainly need better uh, debt management across the board. Um, and then uh, last uh, question I think was uh, from uh, Alberto uh, Iskut. Um, so, you know, everything that is crucial to the achievement of uh, macroeconomic and financial stability is macro critical. Um, and that certainly is, is broader than, than what the IMF would, would look at traditionally. Uh, as I've tried to, to argue in, in my intervention before, um, uh, environmental, social aspects certainly are macro critical. Um, I mean, climate change uh, is, is one of the determining factors of, of, of uh, uh, our, will be one of the determining factors of our economy. Uh, just if you look, for example, at uh, the impact of decarbonization of, of, of the global trading system, uh, this will have massive repercussions. There will be massive implications on, on balance of payments, exchange rates, international capital flows, all that. Uh, so it's very much at, at the heart of this. But, um, Global climate change also has huge implications on, on uh, um, uh, uh, social outcomes. And these by themselves can also be destabilizing. So for example, in our report on climate change and sovereign risk, we also highlight uh, political risks. We know that climate, there's strong empirical evidence that climate change um, or the, the physical impacts of climate change uh, are uh, 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 kind of accelerating uh, intrastate conflicts, for example. So there will be huge, uh, potentially destabilizing effects in some parts of the world um, and, and political instability um, uh, and macroeconomic and, and sovereign instability uh, are very much linked. So it is a very comprehensive package um, and the IMF uh, cannot, cannot have kind of its narrow approach that it used to have. And the good news is uh, to finish uh, that uh, uh, Christina Georgieva is certainly pushing the IMF uh, and its membership to, to take this broader perspective. Um, and and uh, uh, it has to be a bit accelerated, this process. Thanks so much uh, to, to all of you and every, every one of the attendees. We had over 100 people come today uh, to be part of this important conversation. Obviously, we're in the middle of a crisis, but uh, the impetus for this report was to look at the cracks in the system that the crisis and its uh, media response have, have really exposed. And while we're in the middle of uh, trying to attack the virus, uh, protect the poor and mount a green and inclusive recovery to learn some quick lessons about what some of the more fundamental reforms are needed in the system. So that when these further pandemics, climate crises, capital flow crises, et cetera, that continue to cycle every three or four years into the world economy, that we continuously try to learn uh, to improve these institutions to make sure that we have stability-led growth and development in the world economy. Uh, if you go to our webpage, uh, you can take a look and download the report. It's also here in the chat. We're about to turn that off in a minute. Uh, today's discussion was also uh, uh, live streamed on YouTube, and that'll be on the GDP Center YouTube channel. Really want to thank Isabel Ortiz, Rakesh Mohan, Edwin Truman, Ulrich Bowles, my co-editor, Hai Hong Gao, uh, and all of our colleagues in China who can join us for today's conversation. Thanks, everyone, for coming, and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thanks, everyone.